Hey, I'm Melissa. I'm Jam. And I'm a chemist. And I'm not. And welcome to Chemistry for Your Life. The podcast that helps you understand the chemistry of your day life. Bonus, bonus edition. edition. <laughs> I forgot you say that part and was about to say bonus edition yeah. on top of you. <laughs> yeah. I was trying. Yeah, you were, you were ready to jump again. He caught me. Yeah. <laughs> he looked at me, he looked grinned at me. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm really excited for our questions. Let's jump right in. Okay. Questions from Brian. Why do smells fade over time and where do they go? This is such a good question. And it goes so well with the episode we just uh, had last week about the states of matter. Ah. Because um, smells are vapor chemicals. Right. And they enter your nose and you sm- they hit your the old factory. Yep. Good your old factory. <laughs> your old factory receptors. And they trigger like, oh, this is this or that, whatever. Yeah. So... But they're just gas molecules, basically, right? It's like the whatever it is into a gas form, and that's how we smell it. Right. So where they go and why they fade is because they're just gas spreading out. And so then there's not a large enough concentration of them to trigger your receptors. It's like one molecule instead of like, you know, a bunch. Right. And the other things are more abundant. So that yeah. they might be all you smell instead. Mm-hmm. Interesting. Huh. Yeah. Or they just don't have, they can't trigger enough of your receptors if there's only like one, one molecule in the whole breath you take in, you know? Right. So how many, yeah, that's interesting to think about because there's smells that are still around. We just can't detect them. Oh yeah. You could say. Mm-hmm. One might could say. Yeah. So that's where they go. Wow. They spread out. Basically the gas just, the gas just be gassing. Wow. That's crazy. It spreads out. What a question. Good job, Brian. Yeah. That was, I was like, yay, this goes so well. <laughs> This next one is from Kiana. Kiana asks, why is vinegar recommended for cleaning out of a bottle of oil if oils are nonpolar and vinegar is polar? Kiana, that's a great question. I have two questions. I, have you heard of this being recommended before? I've never heard of that before. No, I've only heard vinegar like recommended for cleaning stuff. Got to break some things down, which kind of makes sense to me. Yeah. Or like kind of grimy stuff or whatever, but not this. Okay, so I have a th- I have some theories. Okay. My first question is, does it work? Because just because something is recommended doesn't mean it works. Right. And then my second question is, vinegar is acidic, which means it um, it has like an abundance of extra uh, or of easily give upable protons. Basically, mm. if you have a vinegar molecule. It's also called acetic acid. And literally, it can just sort of give up that uh, proton and the electrons that are left behind are pretty easily stabilized. Mm. So it's possible that the vinegar reacts with something in the oil to protonate it, essentially making the oil then polar and then the water wash Mm. it away. But I don't know. There'd have to be something like oxygen in the oil that could be protonated or something so yeah I, I think it would depend on what type of oil it was and um the other thing i thought about is yeah is vinegar just acidic enough that's what that's what acidic usually acidity does really is it gives it protons but does it do something else is it mm. i don't know is it it has a very yeah it doesn't really have long enough of a chain to be like an emulsifying agent so those are the only questions I had is does it work? And if it does, maybe it gives a proton up to make the oil be suddenly polar and able to be rinsed by water. And would it be better? And my thought would be like, my guess would be not, but would it be better than just throw some soap in there and some warm water and shaking it around and letting the soap do its thing to the oil? The only know? thing that soap does though is bubble up and then it's so annoying to get out of those bottles. Right. I mean, it is, but it gets all the oil out. It does get all the oil out. Soap is probably more effective. It's just more bubbly. Right, right. So that would be a question I have. Yeah. Hmm, interesting. Good thought. Uh, this is another vinegar question from somebody else. So it's like kind of interesting this happened. But Sam Wise asks. I, I do post the question sometimes on Insta. Uh, so I wonder if one person saw it and triggered the other person's. Right. Like, and while we're thinking about vinegar. Yeah. So Sam Wise asked this. Well, how does vinegar curdle milk? Okay, so we've talked about proteins curdling before mm. in the infamous egg episode right right with the uh example of eggs being the proteins in eggs being like rolled up christmas lights mm-hmm. and then when they spread out that's similar to denaturing a proton 
protein. Uh-huh. Is the folding of the protein kind of breaks up and then they all link together and that's what happens when you cook eggs. Right. Unfolded right. proteins link up. So vinegar curdles milk by m- instead of using heat to put energy in to break the uh, bonds or intermolecular forces that ugh, keep the protein folded up, it uses acid. Basically, it will, the acid giving up prot- protons or whatever will be able to break up the protein's foldedness and make it unfold mm. in such a way that then the milk is curdled. Dang. So it's very, very similar. You're basically, instead of heat to break the bonds and unfurl the proteins, you're using acid. You're chemically breaking the bonds instead of, I mean, both of them are chemically, but you're using chemicals to break it instead of heat to break it. Interesting. Why would you want to do this for with milk? Okay, well, that is a good DIY buttermilk hack, is uh-huh. if you don't have buttermilk, you can just put some acid in milk, and it will kind of curdle it. But also, I, I'm like, is it just because the vinegar... <laughs> is acidic enough to react with whatever negative you think, and that's why it replaces buttermilk. Mm. But I have used this hack to replace buttermilk in a cake recipe n- numerous times. Interesting. Huh. Good tip. Yeah, I was going to say, like, if somebody just, like, was like, oh, you know what my favorite drink would be? The best thing. Combining <laughs> them, my favorite two things, I love vinegar and I love milk. I just wish I could have some vinegar milk. And they keep combining <laughs> it, and they're like, oh, man, it keeps curdling every time. Yeah, I, I don't know why else you'd do it other than to make fake buttermilk. Yeah, vinegar milk. Um, well, that's what they called it, like, when you're replacing it. This next one is from Kaiba, and here's what he says. Not a question, but kind of a fun fact about the menthol episode. I've heard that if you take something spicy with capsaicin, your mouth gets pretty hot because of the receptors. And since the menthol gives a cold sensation, a cold sensation, you can cancel out the hot. But that's actually not true because capsaicin and menthol activate different receptors. So you will feel both cold and hot at the same time. <laughs> this makes me want to get a mint and take a mint and eat a jalapeno yeah. at the same time. I wonder if it's not true. Like He's correct. But mm-hmm. like something about the sensory experience feels like one's kind of being canceled like one's out. one's soothing the other almost. Right. Or like you're sort of distracting your own brain a bit uh-huh. by adding a new feeling in there. Yeah. So maybe it feels like the spiciness is going down because our receptors are experiencing something else too. Yeah. But it's like a sort of fake. Well, also we do have an episode about capsaicin as well. So yep. we have a menthol and a capsaicin episode. So listen to both of those in different ears and at eat both at once. Yep. Just kidding. Yeah. That would be insane. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then as a follow up, my friend Kaylee happened to ask, independent of this podcast, where do you store your thin mints? Why would that matter? It matters. I mean, I don't have any. So If you had thin mints, do you have strong feelings about where you keep them? Okay, well, in my family, we always kept them in the freezer. Okay. Except I would ration when I got older. I would be like, only three in the freezer or else I'll eat the whole box. Right. Because Thin Mints taste better when they're frozen. Okay. This is one of the things I don't get because I don't like mint things. I like Mm, mints. Yeah, okay. You know what I'm saying? So So I think I've wondered if it's because, you know, part of what people like about Thin Mints is that that menthol cooling sensation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And if you make it frozen, it enhances that sensation ah. alongside the chocolate. It's like... Okay, so the chocolate, I thought maybe I was part of it, though, because, mm-hmm. of course, putting chocolate things in the freezer is a common yeah. thing for a bunch of chocolate yeah. stuff. But, yeah. Interesting. Yeah, so that was my theory. Kaylee asked that, and I was like, oh, yeah, definitely put them there. I, and then, and Kaiba had just sent this, and I was like, <gasps> maybe it's about enhancing the menthol sensation, the cool receptors. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. So I had to include it. Yeah. Um, and we want to know, listeners, where do you store your thin mints? Yeah. <laughs> I will say we did a, um, back when I had some roommates, we did a taste test deal for some of the Girl Scout cookies and their imitations from Aldi. Uh-huh. I don't know how many of them Aldi does or if they always do them, but they, there's at least, I think around three that uh-huh. Aldi has a version of. Um, thin mints are one of them. The peanut butter ones. I don't are, know what those are called, but I know what you're talking about. Yeah. And then I was the, a Girl Scout. Don't at me. <laughs> whoa. And then the circular donut ones that have the 
stuff on them. The coconut? Yep. Those have different names. Yeah. We call them caramel delights. I don't remember. But anyways, I think all they had all three of those. Mm-hmm. We did a blind taste test of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and I would do want to say that at least for both the and the peanut butter ones, we did put them in the freezer. And oh. I will say that in our very limited situation, no shame, no shade thrown at the Girl Scouts, but Uh-oh. the Aldi versions won more times than they lost. Oh. So. You just, know, I haven't bought Girl Scout cookies in a long time. Maybe I should. Yeah. Um, but I I just don't really know any Girl Scouts. <laughs> There's one in our neighborhood. They posted recently like, hey, if you need some Girl Scout cookies. I feel like it would be so different. Like going door to door. My mom didn't let me, but other kids' parents uh-huh. let them. She would like take it to work and stuff. But I'm like, now you would sell it online to like. Yep. That's what they do. They just post it in our, in our neighborhood's like yeah. Facebook group. And it was like, hey, my daughter's a Girl Scout. We got your cookies. And they literally had this, this picture of just like <laughs> boxes of cookies, like boxes and boxes stacked up. And I was like, yeah, I want some. Also, here's a little shout out. Recently, Mason, I made Mason watch this movie and there were some problematic things about it, but for the most part, it's, it held up and uh-huh. it's Troop Beverly Hills. Oh, I've never heard of this. Okay. Lots of people haven't. It's kind of an obscure one, but it's about these girls who want to make a Girl Scout troop. It's not called Girl Scouts, but it's basically Girl mm-hmm. Scouts mm-hmm. in Beverly Hills. And, um, it's just a funny little movie. It's It's got Shelley Long, who's Diane from Cheers. Yeah. And I don't know. It's not very well known. And, you know, there are some things that I'm like, oh, would not recommend that parenting style. But <laughs> it's funny. Yeah. And it, it's kind of like a wholesome little movie. And Mason actually really liked it. So nice. nice. Now that we're on the topic of Girl Scouts, I'll just do a little plug for that. <laughs> so this next question, I'm going to try to pronounce this correctly. This is from the bit names easy, Peyton, but. Peyton asked, why does cyclohexane <laughs> dissolve paradigm? That was, sorry, that was an autocorrect. Oh. Parafilm. <laughs> oh, parafilm. I was like, paradigm. And I tried to autocorrect again. That That's so funny. I never thought about it. I was like, what's hard to pronounce? No, no. I just <laughs> was like seeing, it yes. didn't seem that hard, but I was like, I don't know if I've seen No, this. that's right. Cyclohexane. Yeah. Dissolves parafilm. Uh-huh. Peyton also said, "Def not asking because I spilt it all over the lab today, which made <laughs> me laugh." Um, so, like dissolves like. If anything dissolves anything else, it means they're made up of this of similar things. Okay. For the most part, so okay. if you spilled something, so, so parafilm is like this weird. There's been a lot of like hype about it lately on the internet, but basically, it's like this plasticky stuff you can use to seal off your um, glassware in the lab. Mm -hmm. So it's almost like plastic wrap, but it's thick and you like sort of heat it up with your hands and stretch it over and then like Mm. squeeze it on and it'll stick. So it's kind of like cling film, but thicker and sciencey. Yeah, like the beeswax wrap, but it's like a pure sheet. Uh And lately on Twitter, people have been talking about it being edible, which I would never put that in my mouth. So I wouldn't. Don't People do are it. so obsessed with seeing what we can and cannot eat. <laughs> I know. I'm like, you're scientists. <laughs> like, can we cook this chicken in medicine? It's like, why? <laughs> why do it? Why do that? Um, but so cyclohexane dissolving parafilm is probably because they were they had a bunch of things sealed off with parafilm, uh, and then they spilt cyclohexane on the bench top, and it dissolved yeah. their parafilm. So I'm assuming it happens because they have similar polarities, which means intermolecular forces, baby. Ah. That was a fun little trip down memory lane. I used to, it's just so satisfying to use parafilm. I feel like there's got to be an ASMR genre of like (laughs) parafilm. Yeah. Interesting. I need to look it up because I'm like, from your description, I'm still not quite fully figuring it out. All right, we're back. She showed me parafilm. I've seen it now. I I think it is parafilm wax. Ah, uh, okay. Is why it's called parafilm, parafin wax. Nice. But also, uh, go on TikTok, type in parafilm, and there was good videos of it. You could see people stretching it. Yeah, but I think no one's going to think it's edible looking. It is appetizing. technically edible, but, but don't ever put things in the lab in your mouth. It's a dumb thing to do. Right. And also, like, it doesn't look like anything that we eat, though. Mm-mm. That's the thing. Looks it like was, beeswax. Yeah, if it was, like, a little bit red or a little bit green, I'd be like, oh, fruit roll up. You yeah, know? it would look like a fruit roll But up. that's it, though. It's, got, it, it's still, that's not really real food. That's like yeah. a made-up thing we created yeah. in a lab. Yeah, I don't know. People people are weird. Yeah, that's strange. That was a funny one. Okay, this next one I'm going to address because it 
honestly, it's something I've been avoiding thinking about. So I think it's time. Okay. So we got two different questions. First, Kevin asked, are candles toxic? What kind of chemicals do we breathe in with candles and air fresheners? And then Sandra asked, oh, she said, Kevin read her mind. She said, a few months ago, I was looking for a scented candle and one of them had a warning saying it could be carcinogenic and it's been on my mind ever since. Mm. So those are both really good thoughts. And the thing is, I just think that this is a really gray area because a lot of, as we know, fragrances and scents are not controlled by the FDA. Right. But asking if candles are toxic is kind of, in my mind, close to asking if fire is toxic. Mm. Because you're getting a combustion reaction. It's burning the wax. And there is likely to be incomplete combustion that takes place, meaning that it doesn't all turn into carbon dioxide and water right. which, and heat, which should be the byproducts of it. So it is possible that there are other things in the air. Mm. Now, separately, like, so if you had an unscented candle and the wax completely burned, I think that theoretically they would be safe. Okay. I think. I don't do any research for these episodes, but just like <laughs> thinking about fire and what it is. But even soot, you're not supposed to really breathe in. Right, right. And I think soot might be like, because, um, you know, sometimes like candles will have the brown stuff that come up. Yeah. I think it might be like part of either incomplete combustion or the wick, maybe. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I have a lot of questions. But so in that way, I'm like, any incomplete combustion probably isn't great. Yeah. But then the the scents do stir in a question. Yeah. That's like, what is that scent? It's not controlled. Just like all the fragrances that we've talked about. Yeah. That are not controlled. And typically I avoid fragrances. The one exception to that really is my shampoo, but like my lotion, all that uh, face wash. I try to go unscented everywhere I can. Yeah. Except for in my personal products, my shampoo is scented and conditioner. Yeah. And then I do have a few scented candles, but as I don't burn them every day. Yeah. So I don't know. I've gone back and forth on this. I don't think it's impossible that these fragrances are extremely dangerous, but I don't think they're likely any more dangerous than a lot of other fragrances that we have in our homes. They just happen on their own or you mean like. Like the other scented things. Oh, I see. Oh, you mean candles versus like... Yeah, like other scented products. Got it, got it. So, but also if you're in a well-ventilated area, but then I guess if you're using a candle to make your house smell good... You're probably not trying to vent it out. Yeah, yeah, so I don't know. I guess I feel like this is a big old gray area and I haven't done research on it and maybe it's going to be worth an episode. I don't think I can like unilaterally say candles are toxic and I don't think I can unilaterally say that candles are not toxic right i think that this is one of those gray areas yeah where everything in moderation and i wouldn't freak out people have been lighting candles in some way for a very long time and it's been fine yeah um you know so sort of like my approach to bpa yeah i avoid fragrances when i when i can sometimes it's just not really realistic yeah and obviously, you know, we know fire was such a necessity for such a long time. Like, yeah. straight up fire, even though it has, you know, mm -hmm. soot and all that kind of stuff. It's like, but clearly it, we've been able to survive yeah. long enough to but keep. But a lot of times that fire was outdoors. Right. That's true. But you're still yeah. breathing it in. That's the most ventilated area I know. <laughs> <laughs> and it's very smoky, though. Yeah, like, true if that. you go to a campfire, it's like I have to wash my clothes and uh -oh. hair and everything. Yeah. There's no way you're not breathing it in. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I would say don't freak out about your candles, but maybe maybe we can do an episode where we dig into it and you can try to find some good, trustworthy resources. Don't buy into fear mongering because I did see a, I think it was a reel or a TikTok where somebody said, there's all these volatile organic compounds in your candles and you're just breathing those in and they're dangerous, but volatile organic compounds are everything. We have them on our skin. Mm -hmm. Fresh cut grass smell is volatile organic compound. Yeah. You know, volatile organic compounds are everything. So. And you've even said volatile is not a bad word. No. It, it sounds like it to the lay people hearing it. But, but it just means it can turn. It's something that can easily vaporize, like easily go from 
like the liquid on your skin to gas. And that our volatile organic compounds is what attracts mosquitoes to us. Right, right. So we even have those on our skin. So don't buy into the fear mongering. But yeah, I mean, it's yeah. possible we shouldn't breathe, breathing in whatever those smells are. But I don't yeah. know because they're not regulated. Yeah. Maybe also similar to tattoos. Like we just need to stay posted. Right, right. And try to take in more information. And if you really like the glow of a candle and you're worried about it, maybe opt for an unscented one. Yeah. And I'll learn more. It's a, I've got an open file on it. I haven't really dug into this because I felt like it would be a lot of mm. little pieces. So, But now that I know y'all are wondering, I'll add it to my file. Nice. And last are some fun ones from our patron, Bree. Nice. This first one from Bree is specifically addressed to you probably because I don't know how I would even answer it at all. <laughs> so I'm totally cool with that. Bree asked... Melissa, what is your favorite macro molecule and why? Okay, do you know what a macro molecule is? Uh, you pro- have we talked about it before? Uh, probably in passing, but I usually use a different name. Okay. So you don't know? No, I don't. Okay, a macro molecule is a molecule with a large number of atoms. Okay. So a good example of a macro molecule is. Polymer. Yeah, nice. polymer, okay. proteins, things like that are considered macromolecules. Okay. okay. Well, I have an answer to this, but it's probably not very helpful to any other people. Okay. Lot, there are lots of macromolecules we've talked about, and I like them all. Yeah. But the first one that came to my mind is the first one that I learned about, which is called a crown ether. Uh-huh. And they, they're weird. They look kind of like crowns. They're like oxygens linked together by these two carbon bridges Uh and um, you can, they were discovered on accident, which I think is really cool. I love that they were discovered on accident. This is what they look like. You can look up a picture. Oh, interesting. You just type in crown ether. Mm -hmm. Um, And depending on how many oxygens you have, they can be bigger or smaller and they will correspond to the size of ions and they can capture different ions really effectively interesting and they were um sort of made on accident he was trying to find something else and the lore is that he like had a fraction of his column that he didn't throw away so that means like he was doing a purifying technique and he had some liquid that he thought was not important and he set it off to the side and then he came home the next day came home came back to lab the next day Uh and it had crystallized into a Uh really beautiful crystalline structure and he was like oh what's that yeah and so I like the idea that it came from an accident, and it was one of the first ones I ever learned about in my undergrad research group. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. Huh. So that's probably my favorite macromolecule, but I thought it would be a good chance to teach you what a macromolecule even was. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Just a big, it's what it sounds like. It's a yeah. big molecule, and they usually have, like, cool functions. You okay. Know? Nice. Like, cool crystals. Mm-hmm. But she threw in a, a bonus question for you, Jam. Oh, okay, nice. Which is, what's your favorite element on the periodic table? We have been asked this before, but mm-hmm. it, you know what happens? Every time we get asked a question twice, it's always long enough yeah. where I don't remember what I said. Well, Mercedes also asked it, and I just said carbon because I think I have to because I'm an organic chemist. Right, right, Nothing right. Nothing else really strikes my fancy. Okay, here's what I think I would have said last time. Okay. I think, and maybe I didn't, but I've always been interested in tungsten because I just know it has mm. the highest melting point. Interesting. I I've, didn't know that. I don't uh, have that. Fact. I've been told that maybe specifically to metals. I don't know. Maybe other things have higher melting points, but. Well, yeah, salts have really high, like sometimes they just degrade, but it right. might be the highest melting point of like a pure element. Right. And I remember, I just have thought like, that's crazy. That oh, of crazy. course, you know, you got, there's got, you got these ones that are like mercury, which is just a fascinating. Mercury is wild it's just a fascinating element it's hard to say it's your favorite because it's like like weird it's and bad it's bad, bad and stuff. things yeah but it's super interesting but that's like easy that's those are the kinds of criteria that like a non-chemist would go based off of you know mm-hmm. but in terms of like having experienced with one or having i don't know some deeper interest in it or knowing mm-hmm. how many things it's part of or whatever it's hard for me to really like yeah get that into it but i don't know yeah, I feel like it's hard for me because I'm like, well, one atom by itself doesn't do a whole lot. <laughs> right. But if you take carbon and you put it with hydrogen and maybe just a few other little babies like oxygen, sulfur, like randomly in there, it uh-huh. can do so many things. And that's what draws me to it. It's yeah. like carbon is the 
carbon and hydrogen really are the backbones yeah. for so much manipulation of atoms in making new things. I have an idea. What if instead I officially pick iron and then your element and my element make cast iron? <gasps> wow. <laughs> Is carbon, ca- cast iron has carbon in it? Yeah, I think they said, I remember carbon seeing something steel. that said it was like around like 10, 5 or 10% carbon we've talked about it before yeah. but i can't remember so for that's cast, cute for cast iron and carbon steel they use like just slightly different like blends or mm-hmm. what do you want to say like alloys i guess whatever but could you imagine like a little cartoon where you're iron and i'm carbon and together we make and you go Poof, and they, like iron. we like do like a little like a chest bump or like yeah. fist pump or something and then we like combine and then like yeah. cast iron comes out of the smoke and then it says chemistry for your life yeah on it. Yeah, that'd be dope. That's also, what came to my mind. The downside, I think, if we really try to stress that really far, it might be the other way around. Or I don't know. Like, iron is most of what makes up cast iron, and the carbon mm-hmm. is super important. So it's like that wouldn't maybe be the other way around would be better if we were like having to pick ones to be mm, as part of it, so, yeah. or something like that. Anyway, either way, either way, we love cast iron. That's and true. Those two elements make it happen. So that was a good answer. And iron is cool. I mean, a bunch of other ways too. So yeah, and you can make that Ferris wheel joke because uh, oh yeah, because iron is F E for uh, I don't I Ferris. It's like I don't think the original word was Ferris, but yeah, Ferris is used to describe iron things a lot. Huh. Anyway, so F E is the chemical symbol for iron, and so people will be like, "What do you call a?" thing made out of iron a ferris wheel or like a, <laughs> a wheel made out of iron or whatever oh i see i see yeah. first time i heard that i was like a wheel made out of iron heavy yeah <laughs> well that's all the questions we have so that was really fun thanks for sending in questions on instagram i really enjoyed it thanks for letting us talk about chemistry and have such a fun hobby that we get to do i think sometimes it's easy to kind of lose sight of what we're doing like oh we've been doing this for so long and so i research a topic and we come here and record it yeah but then inevitably someone will reach out and tell me how excited they are or what they're learning about chemistry and those mean so much to me because i think it's easy to get zoomed in and forget the impact that we're having yeah and even uh, my boss and i were working on something related to the podcast and he mentioned i mentioned that we got we got forty five thousand downloads last month yeah and he thought, he said, I just think that's such an incredible accomplishment. Like, yeah, there's so many people learning about chemistry right now yeah. because of you. He didn't say the last part, but that's what I was thinking. Like, there's so many people learning about chemistry because of, because of this show, yeah. which is made possible by all of you listeners. So it, it always really, when I get a moment to stop and reflect, blows me away that we get to take part in this and be a part of this community. Yeah, definitely. And we're really appreciative of y'all's questions and being able to mm-hmm. uh, talk about those on our Q and R's is super fun. So please keep yeah. this coming our way and you can reach out to us and send us your questions when we'll post them on Instagram most months, but also you can do it on our website at chem for your That's chem mm-hmm. F O R your life.com to share your thoughts and ideas. If you'd like to help us keep our show going and contribute to cover the cost of making it go to patreon.com slash chem for your life or tap the link in our show notes to join our super cool community of patrons. If you're not able to do that, you can still help us by subscribing on your favorite podcast app and rating and writing a review on Apple Podcasts. That also helps us to share chemistry with even more people. This episode of Chemistry for Your Life was created by Melissa Collini and Jam Robinson. Jam Robinson is our producer, and the episode was made possible by our financial supporters over on Patreon. It means so much to us that you want to help make chemistry accessible to even more people. And those supporters are Avishai B, Bree M, Brian K, Chris and Claire S, Chelsea B, Derek L, Emerson W, Hunter R, Jacob T, Christina G, Lynn S, Melissa P, Nicole C, Stephen B, Shadow, Suzanne, Sam N, Stephen B, Timothy P, and Venus R. Thanks again for everything you do to make Chemistry for Your Life happen. We'd also have to give a special thanks to our team of reviewers who reviewed this episode. Mm-hmm.